Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, panel on uh, ecology, climate, and strategy games. Uh, I am uh, Adrian uh, Janssen from Abbey Games, uh, and I'm joined by uh, Anna. Please introduce Hi. yourself. I'm Anna Barham. I'm from Balancing Monkey Games in New Zealand. Um, I'm the co-founder and managing director there. Um, we started up in 2017 and um, we're working on our second game, which is very exciting. Very exciting indeed. Uh, and Paula, if you could introduce yourself as well. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Paula Esquadra. She, her pronouns. I serve as the senior UX strategist for Xbox Game Studios Cloud Publishing Division. Uh, and I also serve as the co-founder of the International Game Developers Association's Climate Special Interest Group, which is very long. <laughs> nice to meet you all. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, so I am Adrian. Uh, I am a designer at Abbey Games. Uh, and we are currently working on our fourth game, which is a sequel to our first game, Rius. So Rius 2, that is. Uh, I hope uh, you guys will see more about this in this Tacticon. Um, so this panel is about ecology and climate in uh, games, and strategy games and management games uh, specifically. Um, well, we all have worked with something uh, like that. Um, so maybe we could start out by uh, telling or, or uh, discussing about what climate and ecology has done or does in our own projects in the past and maybe in the projects that we're working on right now. So um, I would actually like to start with you, Paula, since uh, you have the most broad view on, on the, whole, uh, the whole industry. Um, so what what has what for what, what kind of role did it play in uh, what you're doing and in the project that you helped? I think uh, I feel like that's a huge existential question, and I'm trying to figure <laughs> out where to get started. I, I think um, I, so. I, I've been in the industry for over twelve years, and I started out in behavioral analytics. I was that person that followed you around on ad, like using ads trying to figure out like how do we get you into a game how do we keep you in a game how do we get you to monetize um, and there's always a really big question about uh how we can serve a greater public good like what good those types of ux patterns do um when there's a lot of things happening in the real world um the uh oil spill in the gulf of mexico had happened around 2011 which was a wake-up call for an opportunity for us to rethink what we assume to be good and trying to figure out ways we can like take what was good in games, which drive delight and interest and purpose um, and take it into different spaces. Um, and so um, uh, there were a lot of really interesting conversations that I kept having with like business owners that were trying to go green, policymakers that were trying to engage youth uh, in thinking about sustainability and trying to engage them in ways that old models of education just like weren't doing well. Um, and uh, I quickly learned uh, through a lot of forged and fire moments that games had this amazing potential for us to redefine our relationship with failure. Um, and so thinking about game mechanics and thinking about ways to enable players to like engage with these complex topics and practice and master skills that they can then take into the real world is something that's always been very interesting. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is that like as the climate crisis continues to become more and more prevalent and more difficult to ignore, um, there's also been major business implications for us. Uh, more future investment conversations for companies um, have to consider climate risk. We have to consider where our talent is living and where they may be migrating in order to deal with chronic health conditions, environmental threats, things like that. And so there's a lot of implications that we have uh, to be mindful of as an industry. Right. So uh, y your uh, role is much broader than just design is educational it is also uh like you said it's also about human resources or how to uh you know keep people safe mm -hmm. 
my my day role to start with is just to make sure that game developers have the information they need in order to make the games that make the most sense for them and their teams and how they want to make it. Um, so thinking about what players and emerging markets need and thinking about what developers need to even feel safe in order to be able to have creative problem solving in order to think about these new emerging game mechanics. It's hard to do that when we're in fight, flight, or freeze mode. Um, among all of these other real world existential things that we have to work through. Um, and so making sure that developers at minimum have access to information, have access to research um, so that they can make the decisions that make sense for them. Yeah, right. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Anna, could you also uh, tell what uh, what ecology or climate, uh, the role that it played in your design and your projects? Um, well, we're coming from a much kind of small smaller perspective, I guess. Um, the the first game that we made before we leave uh, was a, a little city builder. Uh, and just through the, the creative process of development, it started out just as a hobby project um, that my husband worked on evenings and weekends. Um, and kind of as part of the, the creative process, um, he decided that he wanted to leave out the violence. So, you know, 4X games have always got that kind of expansion as one of the Xs. Um, and we wanted to leave that out. We wanted uh, I guess to... you mean exterminate, not expansion, because you expend Exterminal? a lot in there. <laughs> Is it exterminate? There's expand, I'm sure there's exterminate. Like... Uh... <laughs> My husband's nodding at me from his desk it's over there. Going, yeah, yeah. Exterminate. <laughs> Probably not exfoliate. <laughs> yeah. Because there's a lot of expanding yeah. in before we leave. <laughs> there is a lot of expanding, yeah. right. We wanted to leave out the exterminate. You can edit yeah. that out. Um, and so with thinking about... Um, the kind of footprint, I guess, that our games leave on the player, leave on the world. Um, we we wanted to think about um, the the kind of industry and headspace that we're creating when you're playing a game. Um, what people are left with as you know, what people are rewarded for, what pe what activities are people performing within this game and, and what they're getting rewarded for. Um, and so we wanted to steer away from kind of any kind of um, violence from exploitativeness. Um, in New Zealand, as um, a country with a, a strong Indigenous population and a really strong value on um, biculturalism, multiculturalism, um, that kind of notion of anti-colonialism um, and um, taking care of the existing environment um, and the Indigenous species and Indigenous people was really, really important to us. Um, it's one of the reasons why when you're playing before we leave, it's you're rediscovering your own civilization. You're not taking over anyone else's. We wanted to steer right away from that. Um, and when we look at the world, a lot of the times it's colonialism and colonialist cultures and expansionist cultures that have done so much damage because indigenous cultures had ways of living in harmony with their environment, which was not exploitative and much less damaging. I wouldn't want to say not damaging at all because I don't have the expertise to say that, but, um, you know, and as white Pākehā is the Māori term for what we are, we are colonial people. Um, and so we wanted to be really, really careful about that when we came to make our game. Right. Um, that's that's the start of it. And yeah. There's more, but we can get into that later on. So there's both both a, both a, an, uh, a historical, a cultural, and an ecological aspect all mixed together in the design philosophy that is in before we leave. And I think it also reflects what Paul also said, right? I think you're kind of on the same both but in a different uh from a different uh, uh role in the development process mm. is that correct so, so you guys match a lot uh yeah <laughs> we we talk we've had a lot of talk um during the development process about how to um kind of best deal with these ideas of environmentalism um 
whether we want to simply make it not possible to do things which are environmentally damaging or whether we want to make it a choice that the player is making and has to balance those consequences. Um, that's a really interesting decision that we oh, talked through. Yeah, definitely. We, we will get to that one as well. Uh, it's an, indeed an interesting problem. So uh, just to uh, talk about a bit of uh, the design in Abbey Games. So we created Rius, which is a, a nature god game where you play different kind of giants that create the planet for the people. So it is actually reversed. Uh, you are not playing the humans. The humans are uh, at your mercy. So you can actually, um, you know, if you want, you could just, they settle a village and you can say like, nah, these guys are, we don't like these guys. So you can just destroy the village and it's, <laughs> yeah, they're done. It's, there's nothing they can do about it uh, unless they get stronger and stronger at some point because you keep giving them stuff and they will develop and develop and develop. At some point they can become strong enough to challenge you. So um, we started that game because, well, this is 10 years ago already. Um, we were students and of course uh, we, we had in, uh, in our group, we have pretty strong environmental uh, heart. So we have a lot of interest in it and um, both um, both in the, in the terms of like knowledge, like uh, I'm a big fan of just biology and ecology in general and uh, in the political sense as well. Um, so we want to do something with it and a God game seemed like a very fun opportunity to, you know, experiment with that idea, especially because there are very little games that you do not play the human role. Um, on the other hand, we also found out that it is very complicated to make a game not about humans because guess what? We are them. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's hard to empathize, empathize with like krill or, uh, or mushrooms. I mean, it's possible, but it's 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 quite hard, especially in the in the sense of ecology, because in ecology we we found like it's there is this very strong need for okay, but but does that mean for me as a human? What what does ecology do for me? Um, and it has been an ongoing topic for us, um, how to do it right design wise, um, and also to create a little bit of a. Um, I say that a, a change of perspective, not necessarily. I think the the there's a lot of perspective already talked about, like in 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 any other media and also in games as well. So for us, it's like okay, maybe we can try it even different. We can say like, okay, now you are nature. What what's your what's your point of view in this? Like, do you feel attacked or whatnot? But on the other hand, you know the 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 goal of the game is to help the humans because it's still a very humanistic game to, to say it in that sense. So that's kind of the role that it plays uh, for us. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about like maybe inspirations or other games that we have played or that we have used as research, uh, maybe uh, games that uh, any of the viewers have played or maybe have never heard for before that are really in your perspective, did something interesting with climate and ecology uh, or something that is close to what you guys did? Uh, yeah, take any of you interested in answering? <laughs> trying to think of like which games I can, there's like a really long list. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and for context as well, one of the things that the, the IGDA Climate SIG has been working on as a community is trying to collect as many games that have climate or environmentally conscious narratives in them. Um, even if it's like, a, you know, a single subplot in like the context of a much broader game. And there's, uh, what we're finding that is that like, so far, since like the 1980s, like there's over 400 games that we can like kind of analyze and speak to. Um, I think some of the games that come to mind are uh, Never Alone, um, which uh, is a platformer game that um, was built in partnership with uh, Inuit indigenous tribes in order to tell the story of their culture and the impacts the climate crisis has had uh, on their ability to you know live and tell their stories. Uh, there's also Abzu, which is uh, like an ocean exploration game that also has a lot of these themes. Um, I will say that one of the examples that comes out most often in the climate sync community is actually Final Fantasy VII. Woke up an entire generation of game developers to the problems of consumerism. 
<laughs> and industrialization. Um, I think there's a lot of different uh, explicit and implicit ways in which games have always talked about the role environment has and our relationship to it. And, um, and yeah. And if we go specifically to like uh, strategy games, is there like yeah. one that pops out or management? Yeah. Games? I uh, I will say like Anno uh, 1800 by Ubisoft uh, comes out as a really wonderful example because one of the uh, uh, one of their United Nations game jam entries from a few years back um, actually factored in environmental impacts as an additional layered mechanic uh, that was distinct from how they designed the game originally. Um, and that was uh, particularly done to raise awareness for how human decision making can play a role in that. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting conversations about um, what we assume to be good, what we assume to be the best way to min-max something and utilize something to the best of its ability. Um, and reframing those mechanics in terms of preservation and conservation is is really an innovative, like curious way to to think about mechanics in a different way. So that's been really great. Yeah, I like that game a lot. <laughs> uh, Anna, do you have like a specific uh, game in mind, specifically if we're talking about strategy or uh, uh, management games that you know really inspired you? Um, I wasn't so much a part of the the process of developing before we leave. I know Sam was very much inspired by the Anno games as well. Uh, it's very much his wheelhouse, um, and you know, played Civilization and. Sims and in fact I think Flashing. what we found was kind of the lack of what there is in a lot of the games of an acknowledgement and an understanding of of the impacts of the environment so ones that we've been playing recently which have been really feeding into what we're doing for the new game are of course Wandering Village um, by Jay Fawn which I love and I can get totally in the zone and just play it for hours um, so, of course, in, in Wandering Village, you've got to take care of your creature that you're riding on. And that's a, I mean, that's a tremendous metaphor for the planet that we're on. We need to take care of it. Um, what we're doing a little bit differently in our new game. So in Wandering Village, um, Onbu is, you pet him and there's essentially an animal that you're riding on the back of. In Beyond These Stars, Kiwa, your giant space whale, is a sentient being with a mind of his own, with ancient wisdom that he may or may not share with you, depending on how you treat him and uh, treat the environment that you're living in. Um, so that's something that we really wanted to to lean into, I guess. Um, the other one that I've been really enjoying lately, it's terrible. I get terrible headaches from spending too much time on my phone. Um, Terra Nil, so bad. <laughs> Just a fantastic, fantastic game. So, yeah, loved it to pieces. Ruins my screen time goals 100%. <laughs> yeah. So, and, like, squinting, like, going, like, it's okay. Um, if, it's, if it's okay, I actually have one more example. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, yeah. From a few years back. Um, uh, so when I was in nonprofit education, uh, I was working for a, uh, like, nonprofit video game studio called Glass Lab. Um, and uh, we had received uh, a grant to take the commercial version of SimCity and turn it into something that could be used in the context of uh, middle school science and English classes. Um, and the really interesting thing about what the game designers and re uh, learning scientists did there is that they integrated an assessment engine underneath so that we could understand how children were engaging in systems thinking. And like, what are the parts in which they like, what's the moment in which they understand what cause and effect is? Like, can they articulate what is happening in the game? And um, and so we ended up creating four modules um, based off of the SimCity game um, where, you know, these fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth graders would be engaging in cooperative, like, play and negotiation in, in like, with, with topics that, you know, we often don't always see legislators having, uh, like, deep conversations around, uh, especially today. It's very fascinating. 
Um, but we would have, you know, these very young kids go like, well, I can't put a power plant there because I need more spaces for residential zones so that my, my people who need to come to the city to work have places to live. We can't do that if the pollution is really bad. They're not going to be happy. Um, and uh, it's it's those like very interesting moments that we feel are really difficult to measure when we talk about like an impact related game, but mm-hmm. happen because we're just providing that opportunity to interact with a well-established mechanic in a different way. So I just wanted to share that because it was so yeah, fascinating that's really, to watch. Yeah, that's, that, cool. that's really funny. You see that a lot in games like the the ecological part of the game uh, goes back to human happiness in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. Um, which I think is maybe an interesting design topic in general. So I think uh, a lot of games you could you could maybe put it in two categories you could put it in a in a very humanistic sense so you know take care of nature because that's the best for humans and you can take it on a very uh i would say uh naturalistic uh way of looking at it so take care of nature because that is the goal in itself so i'm thinking about like either also evolution games so like niche it's maybe it's an ecological game in a certain kind of sense also from strafon where you you know have to go through evolution with your with your uh, creature that you're creating or spore in that sense uh, mm-hmm. has that a little bit as well um but for me like just to to add two more games to the to the pile we just discussed um it would be uh, fate of the world maybe you've heard about it it's a pretty old game 2000 10 i think or 2011 which uh, is also uh um i think go create it with oxfam novip and it's really a game where you have to where you sort of become the world government in 2030 or 35 i think uh, and you have to the goal of the game is to keep the climate below uh, uh the, the 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 temperature rise of the planet below three degrees celsius um without screwing over the whole world <laughs> basically so it's a it's a very very hard game and but also very fascinating because there is this i think they predicted that very well there is this very strong uh, tension between the the poorest people in the world basically and the the climate uh, I think it's not entirely fair what they do in the end, but if you don't keep stability up in the game in certain regions, those regions will just opt out of cooperating with you. So they will, you know, start up their coal plans again and that kind of stuff. So you have to really uh, need to balance out whether everybody agrees also with the goals that you set, and if everybody agrees with uh, the problems that there are, right? So that's also. Um, uh, and you have to give and take sometimes. So I think that's a very interesting game. And then a little bit in the in the same vein uh, would be uh, like the last civilization, the last expansion. Um, it has the interesting thing because you are so thinking from that human progress perspective, like you know, going through time. It's also a ve- of course a very, I would say, modernity Western kind of way of looking at what progress exactly means uh but it also tries to fit in ecology in that as well like okay but uh, isn't this gonna cause problems or you know are are the the coasts rising it's it's a very interesting take uh also because i think it also puts in it it actually puts a very fair perspective on uh a, a very fair reflection right because like we think a lot about progress in the way like civilization thinks about progress and then ecology comes in and there's this kind of like i don't know it's it's a sort of a a cool tension that starts to to create where you can also see that the designers themselves have to think about like okay we're not 100 percent sure what it's gonna do and how big the impact should be like if the should the next draw half the city size or should it just you know remove 50 percent of the food that is produced there what does it do with trade routes that kind of stuff it's very interesting to look at um so th- those are sort of uh, uh the games that that i would like to pile up on uh on the list that we just mentioned um but to come back to that like ecology um that human versus nature kind of thing. Uh, I'm very uh, interested in hearing like 
what does that mean for your design? And what kind of approach do you take? And what kind of challenges come out of there? So if any of you. Maybe you uh, it is the first time coming up, but. <laughs> yeah, um, one of the things that we've been looking at is exactly what you said before about human happiness and how very often that gets, um, what's the word, it gets conflated. It's conflated with ecological goals. And so one of the things that our game designers are looking at in Beyond These Stars is not conflating the two, but in fact, putting them in conflict with each other. So there are things that you can do that will make Kiwa happy and the peeps sad and vice versa. Um, and so part of your job as the player will be to balance those and decide what's more important to you in this moment overall. Um, so that's something that would put a lot of thought and a lot of design into. Because there's, there's quite a tension there then, of course, because... There is. Yeah. And, and then additionally, there's also you know, wider... We're introducing um, new alien races in this game. There's just been a bit of a sneak peek of that. In the <laughs> That's very cool. Um, so you'll be able to interact with other creatures in this galaxy. So it's no longer just the peeps versus the spa space whales. It's the peeps and a space whale and these other creatures. And if they've got different ideas of what's good, um, then they'll have different ideas about how well you're doing and whether they want to interact with you in certain ways or not. And so that's going to be a really interesting, we hope, really interesting balance against the challenge for the player. Reintroduce like the exterminate part, like not necessarily as a first thing, but <laughs> if you really if you really disagree with each other, what is the what is what well, would be the design goal? Um I'm just gonna leave that in the mists of the future. Ah, oh, okay. Now, now I have to play it. <laughs> I love this. Like these these conversations sound very familiar. I'm so excited to see how this <laughs> man has with the game from from a broader uh, like publishing and community advocacy perspective. When you know new new game developers come into the climate special interest group or or new new developers that are coming into a publishing agreement are trying to figure out like what are the ways in which I can innovate and create like unique moments in the game that's going to delight our players. Um, some of the conversations that we end up having are really around that, like, what assumptions we have about how we perceive value, like, what do we consider good, what do we consider worthwhile, and what are we headed towards? Um, and some of these are very existential, especially when we talk about um, ecological awareness and sustainability in the industry. Um, for example, like, we're really used to crunch culture. We're really used to, like pushing as many hours of work as we can in order to get to launch and get to a profit. Um, and uh, it's a lot of it is very individualistic versus collectivist. Like there's a lot of information and knowledge silos we've built in because we want that competitive advantage. And that translates to a lot of, you know, strategy games that we've built up historically. Um, but when we talk about how do we think about ecology in games, um, it'll it'll we'll we'll surface the conversation around like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for instance. Um, and Maslow had had built up this model um, with the assumption that we would be uh, we would need to fill our our base needs of food, shelter, safety first in order to get to a place where we are eventually self actualized as individuals. And um, what a lot of folks don't know is that this is actually a subversion. Um, and and uh, was co-opted by the Blackfoot uh, from the Blackfoot nations and First Nations. Um, and from the Blackfoot perspective, um, self-actualization was actually the foundational layer um, with the longer term goal being creating a sustainable community in which you could help each other thrive. There was a collectivist mindset that would be focused on helping create sustenance and value for future generations that came after you. And so um, when we think about different ways to think about strategy games and different ways to think about mechanics, um, we think about like, what are you headed towards when that whole min-maxing strategy? And like, what do you actually want players to go towards? And, and how does that translate to a deeper connection with nature, deeper empathy with the creatures that, you know, are impacted by your decisions? So what is the thing that you're min-maxing is sort mm -hmm. of the, the end. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For us, it's 
it's kind of the the the, the same. Uh, I think I think it's also interesting to note that we're I think all three of, well not well not vastly different cultures, but different cultures in general. Like uh, I'm from Europe and uh, like from Oceania and from the Americas. So it's and even there you have of course very big differences. Um, and I think that also very much impacts on on sort of your your view or your upbringing with nature to begin with. Yeah. Uh, and I always feel like I'm in a very sort of uh, uh, easy position to talk about environmentalism because I'm in a city in one of the most urban areas in the world. <laughs> uh, and for for me, uh, a, a tension that has always been there is specifically the tension between uh, poverty and uh, climate change, or or climate in general. Uh, that you know, I am. I also have a a, a back of a, a background in from another culture, so I'm also Brazilian, and. You know they have a very different view of a lot of things, especially if you compare it to the United States or Europe, where there is the, where there can be this. And I kind of kind of really get that. There can be this view of okay, but you know you you guys had to have like two hundred years of industrialization and uh, yeah. using all the resources. When it's our turn, why can't we do the same thing? And especially when it comes about lifting people out of poverty, I think that's always been a tension in all of the design of the games. Uh, like, okay, how do you... It's not necessarily true that uh, going after those ecological benefits or the ecological goals will be the same thing as making your people happy. So I was very interested in hearing what you said, uh, Anna. Um, there, there can be just this drawback, like, okay, now these guys are not happy. Like for our for our game for Reus two, it's a little bit easier, I think, because you are not playing the humans, so you don't really care if they're that happy or not. <laughs> you get, I mean, you get you get some. You you. It is the goal of the game to make them happy in the end, but you can you can really plan for the long term. And if you if you completely exterminate them as nature, it's fine. You know, the game doesn't judge you for it. Um, <laughs> It's it's uh, no it's, doubt that there are certain days where we're like Mother Nature take the yeah just do this <laughs> yeah go for it they deserve it. You're actually reminding me about Discord. We've got quite a strand in our wonderful um, before we leave community who are convinced that basically before we leave is a planet a uh, space whale feeding simulator, <laughs> and the idea <laughs> to just keep the space whales happy by feeding yeah. all your people. It's just know part what? of ecology, yeah. just doing our job. Yeah. I get it. You have a customer in me. We'll definitely buy it. <laughs> and I just, no, this it's just... Actually really... go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I was just going to say what, what came to mind as you were talking about that is it's really interesting to me that we equate wealth with happiness. Um, like you have more goods and higher quality goods, therefore you're happier. Um, and if you have more goods, and high quality goods, then you will be happier. And if you don't have them, you'll be sadder. Um, so I, I did a degree in psychology. Um, and one of the things that I learned was in social psychology was that in fact, what causes unhappiness is not poverty per se, it's disparity. So if you've got um, a community where everybody's, you know, you've got kind of levels of poverty versus wealth, which are like this, then it's not so bad. It's when you've got levels which are like this, that these people, even sometimes they may be better off, um, but because they can see these people up here, there's that, why haven't I got what they've got? And so what we need is not necessarily lifting people to a greater level of consumption. It's about fairer distribution. Um, so I'm a yeah. <laughs> vote left, vote green. <laughs> Eat the rich. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually been quite a weird journey becoming a studio owner and an employer, um, having grown up in this really left-wing household. My dad's a Labour Party member, just under our doing. It was awesome. <laughs> um, and, uh, and now being in that position where we are the man, 
um, and trying to think how can we use our power now that we are in that position of power um, to lift the base level without and, and bring the, yeah, so. Right. It definitely requires a paradigm shift for how we think about resources and distributing them and like social connection and reducing the feeling that we have to other other people in order to feel like we're gaining something like it's it's definitely it's something that we've also seen from a broader um just like like motivational standpoint like there is there is research from uh quantic foundry uh which is a, a company that helps collect like motivational data across the games that people play and what they found was that um throughout the course of the pandemic uh the players who were motivated to play competitive titles went down and the people who wanted to play more cooperative social community oriented games went up uh because there was a a a sense of feeling starved for connection, for feeling a sense of purpose and community that was like robbed from us when we all had to kind of isolate. Um, and it's and it's translating to how we think about our environment, how we think about the jobs that we're, we have access to and like where we want to live because we crave that. Isn't, isn't that like, a, um, how do you just translate that, that part of like, uh, just, um, what you just said, Anna, um, about, you know, a human happiness as, you know, opposed to ecology and so like, well, we can, you can solve this by saying like, okay, but it, it's, it's a, it's a disparity kind of thing. Uh, that's something I really like about fate of the world, which, you know, addresses this exact point. Um, however, they are quite cynical about it. I think in the end that it's a global thing, you know, there's always going to be that one area that didn't have like 200 or 300 years of, of uh, certain development that will look at other areas and go like, yeah, but they have those kind of things. Of course, I think we all agree that there is some degree of, of poverty lifting that's always good, like, you know, child mortality and that kind of stuff. But yeah. um, if it if it comes to like luxury goods or something like that, it, if, if is, is it something that you uh, tackle in in your new title is 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 the idea of 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 luxury switching or you know that kind of stuff switching as so like going down on your uh, redistributing the luxury that is there is that a, is that a part of your design as well uh, to be honest i'm not sure <laughs> I'm not <laughs> maybe we still have to see that so much conversation going on so yeah. i played the early part of the game but that kind of thing is stuff that comes in at the later the later ah, right, stages yeah. and i haven't got through there yet yeah. there's still a lot of balancing and and still designing going on so. because it's already complicated by itself right like doing the ecology and yeah. the human part in itself and then you also have to model in the human human part too mm. if you're talking about that happiness uh, part yeah mm. I, like i said I, I, we kind of just ignore the problem uh yeah. sort of i don't think it's possible sorry Karen. Oh, uh we have some I was just gonna say uh, <laughs> we have like latency from half the world here talking about ecology so <laughs> go okay. go um so the there is there is this degree of like uh, envy or jealousy in the, in Rias as well, like villages uh, as opposed to in Rias one. Rias one, the, the humans had like no identity at all. They didn't. They just cared about that there was food and that they had stuff to collect, and that's it. But they didn't do that. You know, comparing part in Rias two, they do actually compare with their neighbors and mm. around the world. So if you if one village has like rich nature, you know, a lot of natural resources, that kind of stuff, and they make good use of it. And there's this other part of the world that is lacking in natural re natural resources or the ability to make, um, I would say that, um, prosperity out of it. Uh, then they will get just, they would just not be happy. And they might, you know, either blame nature, you know, in a certain sense, like, well, why would we care about nature? All they do is, you know, give us very little, and they, uh, they, it's it's just something for us to use as much as we can because we have little to begin with. Or they can get very envious or jealous towards their neighbors. It's like, well, give us something of that, you know. So we also try to put it in, but it's actually a quite small part of the game because you're playing from nature's perspective. It's like ants crawling over your skin and fighting each other. You're like, yeah, it's just. A blip in your life, yeah. yeah, in your moment, yeah. 
So it makes it easy for us because there is no, I say that, there is no big judgment for it. Uh, it's a bit more playful, I guess, in that sense, even though it's a very serious topic. Um, and it makes it easy to jump through it. That sort of human happiness towards ecology. That And it's not the only lens you could look at it, right? You, you can also, like, a, like in our game, you can sort of design a little bit around ignoring human happiness to begin with. Not saying that we should, but... Uh, just to give another view of, of a game that you could play it like that. Um, do you guys have anything to add like to, to the topic about like human happiness versus ecology in design? Uh, else I'll just move on to a next topic. <laughs> Don't think so. Thinking hard, but... Um, because another very interesting part is, I think, uh, the exploitation part of a lot of games when it comes to... Uh, specifically strategy and management games because there's this very linear way of progressing through things. I actually want to highlight Terra Nil out of this as well because I think Terra Nil is still... It, it packages exploitation in environmentalism in a certain kind of way because there's this very rigid way of, you know, you just do this to improve things. Right, and you don't know necessarily where you get your. There's not necessarily, I think. Well, maybe I haven't played enough, but there's not necessarily a kind of a balance or a, an ecology to uphold. It's more fixing something in a sort of puzzle space, which I, is really cool, and I really like it, and it gives a very good vibe for it. But I don't necessarily uh, think that it has sort of these these hard problems that you talk about, Anna as well, and and Paul as well, or that are, for example, in Fate of the World or um, I think a great yeah. counter example is uh, Factorio, <laughs> yeah. where you crash land on an alien planet and the best thing you just can go. do is just hoard all of the natural resources regardless of whether or not the alien race is actively trying to get you to stop. Yeah. Um, and you, you can certainly have like a non-combat like toggle in order to avoid that fight, but you're essentially, you know, taking resources and killing indigenous creatures in order to like get back off the planet or continue to just create more power lines. Um, and it's, it's, there's kind of, um, I don't know, there's a, there's a self-awareness with that kind of game that um, still doesn't necessarily make <laughs> the exploitation themes any better. Um, but I think it also, it speaks back to a lot of the things that we kind of take for granted. Like so many of the games, especially in the early 2000s, were focused and framed around the idea that like exploitation was the main path. Apocalypse is a given. <laughs> There's never like a, a pause before to take a step back and be like, are those the problems that we assume can't be solved? <laughs> um, it's a big, it's, it's so interesting mm -hmm. to see how that's evolved today. Yeah. It became um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no I already can't. talked. It's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I've got two things that, that came to mind. First of them is um, Terra Nil, if you haven't played it long enough, you may not have come up against the, the actual serious balancing problems that you can have. Yeah. Um, so if you, you, you've got a, a set of environmental goals and some of them are mutually exclusive. Um, and so the first time I played through, for example, the... Um, there's a tundra level and if you get everything just right it starts snowing by itself and then you get these um, aurora sweeping across your landscape and it's absolutely beautiful and just I just about cried it was so lovely but then the second time I played it through I was going for different goals and I never managed to get that and it was so frustrating because there are some things that you have to do which destroy some areas and or some types of for, uh, flora in order to create others and um and stuff like that and so there is a certain amount of that that kind of right. balancing so it, yeah yeah i've I only played it, it on itch.io like three years ago so i should actually play right one. right yeah. right right you should yeah <laughs> the other thing that i was going to say uh what was it now i've forgotten it's gone <sighs> what were you just talking about might come back well, me me or paula <laughs> paula Oh, uh, Factorio? Factorio. Uh, apocalypse narratives and exploitation is a given. That's right. That's what I was going to say. Exploitation is a given. Um, the end of Mass Effect. Yeah. Um, nice. yeah, yeah. You, well, you've actually got to choose whether you're going to, you know, 
which set of needs are you going to fulfill? Yeah. And uh, I love that. I love that. Yeah, that's and it. there's like the good ending and the bad ending and the other ending. Um, so, yeah, I think we just need more of that. Yeah, there's no... There's <laughs> no... I mean, there... Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> there's, I mean, there's lots of games who do that, but I, I love the idea. And, you know, even in a civilization where you choose your path, um, and I think that's, that's a really key mechanic um, that people see, that there are different ways of doing things. Yeah, I also like what you mentioned about Terra Nil then, that, that sort of mutually exclusivity. Also in nature itself, if you look at ecology or biology in it in itself, there's a lot of, you know, this fish gets here, that means that all these other fishes die. That's just how it works. Um, this this sort of mutual exclusivity in a lot of design or in a lot of like, uh, I, f I think it's actually quite important to, to especially, specifically in strategy and management games to grasp like, okay, you're making a choice here and yeah. something or someone is gonna, you know, pay for that in one way or another. I, I mean, it depends mm -hmm. on what you, what you mean with the word pay, but um, it actually costs resources to, for example, in civilization to, to, uh, protect yourself against the, the 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 things of climate change, the, the effects of climate change. But on the other on the other hand, if you're just fast enough and you you know you you industrialize fast enough and you could just go to space first, then yeah, okay, that's <laughs> okay. Who that's that's also that a way of it. yeah, that, that's also a way of yeah. doing it. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why I kept trying to figure out like how I wanted to answer your earlier question about like happiness and yeah. like player happiness. Um, because it's 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 it makes me think of like the the uh, the question that we always get as game developers when we're making a game like is it fun like on a scale mm -hmm. of one to five is it is it fun do people want to keep playing it and play with others? Um, and when we as as our perception of like good game mechanics and good gameplay experiences continue to evolve. I think the question of fun is morphing into um like uh what like what are meaningful choices? Like do do these choices feel fulfilling to me? And is it time well spent that I made these decisions and invested my resources and time into doing this to see the outcome? Um, mm -hmm. is really interesting when we think about, you know, other other genres, like does does my time spent in this game that I've inadvertently spent eight hours staring at actually feel like time well spent coming out of it? Like Terranil yeah. evokes like a very visceral, like this is meaningful to me <laughs> and I want to experience more of this. Yeah, but it's also um, a very fun game. Yes, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's delightful. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's a there's a lot of like like unanticipated delight that comes with like thinking about strategy in a way that I like haven't expected given all of the other games that I've seen before kind of thing. So it's super cool. Yeah, I would call it sort of like fix, fix. Uh, a lot of people want to fix problems when they're mm -hmm. playing games. Darren Hill specifically <laughs> is a fix it game. Yes, um, yeah. Uh, and I think that's just inherent for a lot of people that's inherently fun to do and you know mm -hmm. more nature all the better you know that i think there is there are very small amount of people that wouldn't like to fit, make make you know we're all gardeners to some extent um mm -hmm. <laughs> but and when we put yeah. it into context of capitalism and the fatigue associated with that like i'm making more money and building more stuff what for <laughs> yeah it's a cooking <laughs> clicker Right, like ecological games create a sense of hope because we're creating something that like is giving life and enabling things to thrive instead of that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I see like very much two categories of, of sort of environmental games. You have sort of the cathartic games and you have the, the fix-it games, basically. Mm -hmm. So I would say Terra Nil is a fix-it game, but like uh, I would say like something like Factorio is kind of cathartic in a certain kind of sense. You can just play your worst environmental self to a certain degree uh you make actually... adhd supply chain management the game <laughs> yeah but there's also there's also this part of humanity that's actually in conflict i think that the whole thing about making ecological games is interesting because it's in contrast with another very human aspect of you know getting more stuff or getting getting more power or being able to do a thing that you couldn't do before even though you know mm -hmm. 
you did it at the cost of something else. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the game... Grand Theft Auto and First Person. Yes, of course. Game. Yeah, they both exist. They're the ecological equivalent. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and I think I think we we all have sort of like our, our our own inner devils that we can tame by playing games in a certain kind of way. Uh, even our environmental <laughs> devils. Um, I fall into the category of people that can never choose the renegade option. I always feel so bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't oh. do it. I Dang. think it was so hilarious though. We had a streamer who played um before we leave. I can't remember his name. I feel bad about that, but it was the most hilarious video where he instantly went and cut down all the trees and completely stymied himself because he couldn't do a thing. <laughs> it was My very, very funny to watch. So much watching that. <laughs> I think it's also the kind of games because we made these kind of games. We are kind of all sort of people who who do that kind of stuff. I don't even play Grand Theft Auto, even though I probably would like it. But it's <laughs> it's uh, you know I think everybody has at least some part of that in in it and putting those things together. But I find it very interesting that the games that I saw that put those two things together to create that tension, they have a very unique design problem because you have to police yourself to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, I often find find those games very interesting, but also very straining. Uh, so I, I I keep coming back to Fate of the World, even though it's an old game. But that game is hard, and oh, it's okay. also a lot of people just don't get past like the first half an hour because it's so you know there's just so much mess. Like okay, yeah, there's no way to clean this all up. You will have to make concessions about one thing or another, and maybe mm -hmm. Terranil does that later, and then maybe you're already invested in these kind of things. So Crosspunk would be another one that has that kind of mm. that morally wrenching decision making. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just very. I, I think I have always always felt that they're very strange because they can't just go for the one or the other. Uh, you sort of have to do it yourself it's it's very interesting it's also kind of hard like we, when we talked about like having these decisions or these sort of implications of the of the the things that you did we're often talking them in the context like a mass effect it's the ending of the game right like you, you of course you make some decision as you go but like for most part of your game you're shooting your lasers and all that kind of stuff it's it's you're get alert into it you know you get you, you get you get shifted into it um do you do you have like a, a view on, for example, uh, that that fix it design? So uh, when we talk about environmental issues or talk about uh, climate change, often it's also talked about, you know, techno positivity or uh, th that kind of stuff. And you see that in a lot of games, that there is this focus on, but we will solve it. You know, just. You don't have to take steps back. We will just get more technology and we solve it. And I think most games have this as well as a sort of entry point. But on the other hand, is there do you do you do you people know something that is a little bit more uh how do you say that? Does it have another approach to that or has another perspective on that? Because I don't know any of them. <laughs> There's this very strong sense of progression in almost all games that I've played. Mm -hmm. I'm trying how, to do another game. Yeah, how, yeah, how fun would it be to play? How fun would it be to play a game that didn't have a sense of progression and positivity? And why would you yeah. play a game that just made you feel bad? Yeah, exactly. But it, it's also a statement, right? In a certain kind of way, oh, as, yeah. as 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 games as a medium that you can say like, okay, but mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it's a very interesting thing to see that we don't have, we don't even have that game. Would we even have mm -hmm. that solution in real life? You know, if you get what I mean, like if you even can't play mm -hmm. it, how likely is it that we can do it? <laughs> I, uh, I imagine that there there may be sort of those smaller art games where people have done things like that, but you can't imagine them being, you know, popular. popular. Or, yeah. Yeah. Because it's very, and, very hard to And design. ultimately, as professional game developers if we want to exist we have to make money which means we have to make things that people will buy and there's a tension in that in itself yeah so no exactly and like it's also just a brainstorm kind of thing like is, as, mm. as, as sort of environmental mm. 
games designers is there is there sort of a way to doing that like uh, we tried a little bit but we found it very 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 hard <laughs> i said it very mm. five times to not make the games about humans in the end mm. right mm. You, you can do it in a certain um sub, sub, subversive way or in a sort of artistic way of you know you're not the center of the universe but in the end most players are i would say humanists at heart or at least to some to some degree that they're like well but i don't want to have like people dying because i want to make place for the tiger or something like that um you're almost talking about an environmental one of those like ultra hard flappy bird type of things <laughs> the goal is just to keep going as long as you possibly can before you cark it inevitably which you're going to yeah <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> That that might be more of like the direction that the that it would go into. You know, uh, this it's... also reminds me of other games that like have forced discomfort. Like this isn't a strategy game, but uh, like Papers Please comes mm. to mind, where like yes. there's there's an intentional breaking of the contract with the player, where like you're not giving them agency. Like mm. you're not going to give them a sense of achievement. You're going to make them sit in the discomfort because that is the purpose of the game. <laughs> Mm. And there's something very compelling and emotionally provoking about it. But at the same time, you come away from the game going like, I learned something and I'm sad and I'm yeah. grieving now. <laughs> or happy that I don't live there. Yeah. And, and, and like fear and, and, and fear like doesn't do as much as hope can in terms of like building longer term, like pro environmental attitudes, behaviors, cultural norms and things like that. So it only goes so far, but it does serve a purpose. Yeah, um, but I agree. Like most, most, uh, I think uh, many, many players, I think will say like, I'd go to games for escapism and immersion. Like, why are you making me feel horrible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's 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 a uh, it's it's a hard design problem. I think actually it has implications for for the real world. You know, it's. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I think games are an excellent medium to to experiment and to explore what people oh, yeah. do think, it's interesting that you say that it's actually just making me think you know about my <laughs> my television watching and and book reading you know books have been around for millennia um in some form or another theater um and we now expect when we go to to netflix or tv or whatever that there'll be this vast range of possibilities of things that you can watch so there'll be documentaries, there will be tragedies, there'll be drama, there'll be comedy. And for me, I'm a escapist watcher. I don't want to watch stuff about the real world because the real world is real enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> but there's plenty of people who love watching tragedies and documentaries and all that kind of stuff. And so how more mature does the games industry need to be before we've got documentary games, tragedy games? I mean, we, we do have as as we grow, there's only going to be an expansion of potential genres as people push the boundaries and push the boundaries. And it's it's an exciting time to be living in. Yeah. yeah. It's one of the reasons why games are so like, I don't know, like I know, I know we're in this space because of that exact like opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. and I know there's there's been research on like non-interactive forms of media, like books and film that indicate that um uh Human beings are are um, more willing to suspend disbelief through non-interactive forms of media and consider a reframe of their opinion more so than if somebody were in person with them trying to de like debate and convince them of an alternative viewpoint. And so, if you allow games and the interaction component to like bring players into a new environment that they've never been in before expose them to new ideas cultures perspectives that they've never been in before like games are super super interesting and powerful for that and like harnessing that energy it's super cool i think cool. Every... And not, not that there's anything bad about books and film it's just that you know <laughs> that's different yeah. Yeah, but, there's, but there's not a clear action afterwards sometimes and it's very like what do we do <laughs> i think every gamer can relate to that like everybody had like this game that changed their view like you mentioned final fantasy 7 in the in the context of this this panel as a as a game that you know i think i'm also part of that that group that played final fantasy 7 in that perspective i think everybody has something like that it doesn't matter it, it could be like in in terms of history or in terms of sociology or, or environment it's just definitely true 
but it's very interesting if we're talking about uh, climate uh, and ecology in in specifically strategy games i find it very interesting because if you talk about books and films and that kind of stuff you have because they are indeed non-interactive media there is this whole other set of um emotions that is that is uh, applied to it i think well if you do something yourself then then if you would do something yourself mm -hmm. and i think it betrays a little bit about um I think games betray more about human nature than books and films do in a certain kind of sense that books and films, you can view as them as warnings. You know, I can see a drama or a murder and it doesn't mean that I want to either commit a murder or want to get murdered. It's just that I can, <laughs> I, I can learn from that from a distance in a certain kind of way. There's a different right. kind of emotion. Well, if I would play a, a, a murder game or a murder uh, scene, drama game in that kind of sense, uh, the actions betray a little bit more about what I'm willing to do at what cost, you know? Yeah. Uh, when you go from an observer to an active participant, like, what does that imply? Yes, it's a very well, different That's imply spectrum. that you were a murderer. Yeah. Like, of <laughs> I love of reading a good murder. <laughs> yeah, of, 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 but it doesn't mean that I want to murder people. But then you play a game and you go, like, all murder hobo on GTA or something like that. It, <laughs> yeah. It, it does betray, I think, a little bit about about what our costs if we want to do. And I, I actually think, like, we, we talked about how ecology and, and climate has impacted our games. But I also think that as as gamers in general, so even everybody watching this, it also kind of shows what we can do the other way around. Like, if it's so hard for us as designers to create something that goes about, you know, consuming less or making less or making no progress uh, imagine the amount of political mandate that it's necessary to, to 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 play that out in the real world which also ties a little bit back to like the question that i asked you and i was well like okay but how are you gonna you know balance these things out when when you know we're in new zealand the netherlands and california i guess we're all one percenters if we look to the world perspective Okay, how are we? What kind of what kind of place do we have in those in those games? Mm -hmm. uh, it it's I, it's something I think about a lot, <laughs> especially with trying to make you know games about ecology or about uh, climate. Uh, do you do you guys have any thoughts on that? Uh, because for me, it's very non conclusive. It's something that just it doesn't keep me awake at night necessarily, but it's something that you know every every month pops up in my head. Like, okay, how am I going to relate this in my design? How am I going to take this with me to make something interesting and you know give a new a new perspective on it? Maybe Paula, you already saw some things from other games that have to deal with these issues. I was going to say, like, all of my examples are from, like, the kind of like the the, the business and, like, climate council advocacy standpoint, mm. less so on the game development side, though it inevitably impacts how the game itself yeah. is designed. I think that when we, when we think about ways to have a more collectivist and participatory approach to how we design games, like making sure that our teams are doing the right research and engaging communities directly to give them an opportunity to tell their story, show it meaningfully in a way that's like respectful. Um, also thinking about um, making sure that there is enough time in the development process, which can be really difficult yeah. because we have tight timelines, right, to do this right. Um, but it's it's something that I think when we um, when we think about redesigning how we approach business as an industry, like getting rid of cringe culture necessitates mm -hmm. we make time for self care. Makes like necessitates we have enough time to do this design work in partnership with communities and give them veto rights so that if there's something that doesn't accurately reflect their lived experience, they should have a right to say no. Hmm. Um, it's something that's really difficult um, given we have such strict deadlines to get stuff out the door. Yeah, not only that, like it's, it's a group of people, right? Like we are a pretty small team and we already have major disagreements on a philosophical yeah. level about like, but what does it really matter? Am I going to give you more points for human happiness or am I going to give you more points because y y the vole rat has not gone extinct? You know, it's, mm -hmm. they're both, they're both, both valid questions. They're both valid questions. And, and as, as a game developer at the end, you have to say something 
um and it's hard to mingle everything together i think that it it's a very ch- yeah i i don't envy you i think that's a very challenging uh job to do in general i mean the realistic answer is that like anyone in a publishing role like we need to fund developers appropriately and sustainably in order to be able to give you time to do that work well yeah like, that's, it's really like pay people <laughs> yeah <laughs> give them time. like that's the ideal which in a recession is always really challenging yes right? it is so, yeah yeah <laughs> Our new capitalism <laughs> it never ends. Yeah. Do you have a certain perspective on this as well, Anna? Um, I think it's really interesting what you've been saying, Paula, about kind of the the flip side about studio culture. Um, so for me, I'm not I'm not heavily involved in the game design. I'm I'm the I'm, I think of myself as just the managing director. <laughs> um, so I'm the one that, and I'm called the managing director because I'm one of the um, directors of the company and that I'm one of the owners of the company um, and I do the management. So it's not like a big managing director, like business position. It's, it's, but it I'm does mean you directly the facilitate money. the ability for these games to be successful. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so as that's part of my role, um, it's really important for me to to look at the the bigger picture. So, you know, Sam and MJ and the others are looking at what's going into the game and how they're balancing those, those things. I'm looking at how we as a studio are having an impact in the world. Um, so we, we work a four-day week. Um, we provide health insurance, which is actually unusual in New Zealand because we have um, funded healthcare here. Um, so... I mean, emergency and hospital health care is free um although you can get it faster if you pay through the private I'm system the for a moment <laughs> <laughs> um all your all your pregnancy and you know child um those kind of they're, they're all paid for um but we're we also um deliberately set up our studio in south dunedin um which is one of the it's actually one of the poorest urban areas in the country and it's at risk from um, it's very low lying and coastal um, so it's at risk from climate change we've had some serious flood events um, and it's really important to us that we set our studio up in a place where we're supporting that local community um, and so we are trying to live our lives as part of the solution um, as well as putting it into our game so we consider um, you know, we, we got an electric car, part of the proceeds, you know, part of the money that came out of the business went into getting an electric car, our artist cycles to work, our designers walk to work, you know, stuff like that. We're trying to make it as livable a company as it can be and setting an example in the industry of how you can do this well. Um, we think about things like optimization as reducing um, the electricity used by the computers that are going to be running the games. Um, one of the other things I'm really excited about is uh, uh, the farming systems that we're putting in place uh, in the new game and before we, uh, sorry, and beyond these stars are not going to be monoculture farms. I got inspired, I actually brought it along, by um, these guys here. Mm-hmm. Um, so Neva and Yotam K, I don't know if it's, I hope that's going to be right way around. Yes, <laughs> back to front she, to me on the screen. helped co-lead the Matariki game jam that's happening in Yeah, Japan, exactly, yeah? exactly. Yeah. So we, I heard about them because um, Sam was invited to be a mentor for um, one of their Regenerate game jams. And so I watched the TED talk, got totally inspired, bought the book, and now we've set up um, a re- what we're planning to make a regenerative plot in our backyard. Because um, it's like, we've got all this land, um, we could do this. So we're, we're really trying to essentially put our money where our mouth is and then put that into the game as well. So it's a, um, it's a two-way relationship really. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. You also have your own responsibilities to uh yeah. to lift that out yeah yeah yeah, yeah. all right do uh, we have some closing thoughts about ecology and climate in you know strategy games uh something uh, that popped up during the conversation i'm just like, so excited to have had an opportunity to engage with both of you <laughs> uh, as i mean the, the closing thoughts for me are really like for any game developer researcher student uh player listening to this stream uh, i think 
think about the mechanics that delight and inspire you and regardless of whether or not they come out with an explicit ecological like ethos or theme like think about what it would be like to think about it in service of those values um and those attitudes and behaviors i think there's a lot of opportunity for us to think about how new gameplay experiences can emerge if we think about what our assumptions are about what a good game looks like and what a profitable game looks like um because i think there's a lot of like there's a lot of surprise i think that we can uncover in ways that will delight more and more players um and I think an additional thought to consider as well is, um, especially as we think about, you know, our current and next generation of players, uh, many of whom are Gen Z, uh, who already have purchasing power, uh, an important factor for us to consider in designing strategy games, um, which can be considered niche, but are increasingly more accessible uh, to a global audience. Um, more and more players are increasingly uh, uh, designing like their purchasing around the values that they're aligned to rather than IP and brand um, like pride and things like that. And so um, we have to think about the different ways in which we're meeting these emerging needs in these new markets that we've historically not have access had access to. And more and more players are getting increasingly connected, increasingly social, increasingly engaged in these really big issues. Um, and so ecological game design in itself is a business advantage to take advantage of. Um, so that's what stands out for me. That's definitely true, yeah. Anna, you have some closing thoughts? Yeah, I've actually been thinking the whole way through, right since the start, Paula, when you said something about um, stress reactions, um, was it fight, flight, or freeze? Um, and in fact, those are the most studied stress reactions because they're typical in the male of the species. Um, and in fact, what's really common stress response in females of species is the tend and befriend response. Um, so if you think about herd animals in response to an attack by lions, for example, the, the females will often, well, I can't say often, but you know, there's this behavior where they will circle around the young, put them in the middle and circle around and defend them. Um, where you think about disasters, ecological disasters or political disasters or whatever, and what happens? People go and reach out to their neighbours. Um, people look after, and it's often the, the women um, that are doing that, oh, you've fallen, you need help, let me, let me be that person. And the point of, of going there is that we need more diversity in our stories because the computer game industry has been historically, as we all know, very heavily dominated by white males. Um, and that is changing. And the more it changes, the more ways of looking at the world, the more instinctive, different instinctive responses will be brought in, the more ways of having fun, the more ways of thinking about things will happen. So as we start opening our minds to more feminine, feminist, um, or gender diverse ways of looking at the world, um, the, the more we engage with indigenous cultures, the more we engage, engage with different faiths, which have a different perspective on what, what is meaningful, what is good, what is positive, what is moral, then the more interesting and um, the more fruitful the games industry will be as a source for learning and for growing as a human species. Thank you. There's a big picture for you. Yes, <laughs> it is. Yes, it's a lot of things. So mm. for, for my closing, to just wrap the two thoughts together, uh, I would encourage gamers and game developers in general to play any game and uh, look at from, you know, any game from any part of the world to look at the games that you play from from an environmental perspective just to to challenge yourself you know and, and not necessarily to to go one way or another but there's just so much richness and depth in how humans interact with nature 
and how nature interacts with itself. There's so much to do there. There's so much to explore, so much to see. Uh, and as we already discussed, I don't think there is one there. There is not a game that encapsulates all of those perspectives or all of those problems. And I think there's just so much more to see there. And uh, maybe even if you just play uh, your normal shooter game, maybe there's already a an environmental perspective in that as well that could be very interesting to explore. So I would encourage you to to, to pick up creativity on that one and and. Um, both for your own perspective, like what does this mean to me? And as well as from perspective for me as a gamer, like I would like to see more games about it. It's just a lot of fun to to explore there. So those are uh, th those are my uh, closing thoughts. Um, well, thank you so much for uh, being here and uh, uh, tolerating me. <laughs> uh, You're a delight. Oh, thank you. Oh, both of you as well. Um, <laughs> and uh, I uh, hope to see you uh around i mean we are we are not we're not very close to each other so <laughs> unlikely un unless someone of us plays uh, pays the the footprint bill but uh <laughs> who knows I know, i'm know. hoping to come to gamescom next year so oh, okay that's pretty that's cool. i go and that's that's the one we go to yeah because it's a train <laughs> away so that's easy for us <laughs> oh, lucky and gdc is very far from both of yeah you. we don't go to gdc <laughs> anymore like it's uh it's too far away yeah too yeah. much too much play yeah all right thank Hopefully you very if much we ever do an online event we'll do yeah that. oh that's easier <laughs> yes 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 like this thank you very much thank, thank you. you so much bye bye, bye. <laughs>